Zero. Wow, you said that real confidently. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Well, you're wrong. Get tested on a lot of like C programming. I kind of uh, just finished my operating systems class. So, um, you know, maybe like you can like humble me and make me see like where I need to improve on. And then I have like a couple questions I want to ask after. What's your background? Um, well, I'm a second year um, CS student. Um, and so I've done uh, operating systems now, some computer architecture class. Um, and then I've done some like machine learning stuff and Java and Python too. But my Python is not... Python 2, not Python 3 or like Python, Python as 3. well? Um, okay. But I mean, like my, I've also done Python. Okay. Yeah. Every process has three segments. Do you know what those yeah. segments are? At least three. Um, so we have like the tech segment where all the code goes. We have the data segment. And we have, I know we have like um, heap stack also our segments. And then we have, I think it's like the BCSS. That's where like the uninitialized. Um, Global skill. Okay, I was just about to ask you the difference between the initialized, the BSS, and the data. Yeah. Okay. Um. What comes first in terms of order, or how are they ordered? Let me put it this way: If I just give you, let's keep it simple. If I give yeah. you text, stack, and heap, how are they laid out? Oh, okay. So. Um. So how are they? Okay. I'm pretty sure, I, I know stack is on top. I know stack is on top of heap, of course. And I think text is on top of, um, I don't know. I think text is on top of stack, but um, I might got that wrong maybe. No, I think that that's usually right. So I, I've seen some operating systems where heap is before stack, but text is always on top. Yeah, well, I know like, the stack grows like um, downward and the heap goes upward. So yeah, but it depends on how they're organized relative to each other. So let me ask you this, where we you just talked a bit about stack. Yeah. Um, how big is the stack usually? How big is the stack? Yeah. Um, I know, I know the stack grows. Um, how big is the stack? I'm not exactly sure, to be honest. Give me an estimate. Like, if you were to guess, gigabytes, kilobytes, megabytes. Um. Okay, if this is like, I would say okay. This is just assuming we're on thirty-two bit architecture. I'm gonna throw out a guess, like eight megabytes. Between one to eight, yeah. Yeah. I think in Windows it's one, Linux it's eight, or something like that. Yeah, I do use a lot of Linux, so that's like kind of where my guess went. What's the data structure used? Now let's turn our attention to the stack, What uh, the heap. What's the data structure used to store free heap blocks, blocks of free memory? Linked list, I think, yeah. Uh, it's a linked list, but there's, it has a name. It's called, um, oh, I know this, uh, a free list. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, what are, can you name me some algorithms for heap allocation? Some algorithm for heap allocation, yeah. So I remember actually reading operating systems in three easy pieces. So one of them is just to take um, the first thing that um, like meets the size requirements. Yeah. Um, that's one of them. And then the other one, there's a lot, but there's another one that like does the worst possible choice. Worst like, fit, yeah. Yeah, worst fit, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And there's other alg um what are the other algorithms? Um yeah, those are the two I remember from the Okay, book. that's fine. Best fit, worst fit, first fit, there's a lot, buddy allocation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, now in a C program, I'm putting all this together. So in a C program, if if I'm to do you, how do I get the address of a of a variable in the C program? The address? Okay. Yeah. Well, um, so you just 
well, I, I I can't like type it out, but like I guess there's just, like the ampersand sign right. that you can get the address. Yeah. And does that okay. return a physical or virtual address? I, yeah, everything's virtual. Okay. Um, let's talk a bit of oh shit. Let's talk a bit about physical addresses. Okay. Can two processes share the same physical memory? Two process. Okay, so just thinking it out right now. I know threads share the same memory, so I want to say processes don't. There is an edge case where two processes can share the same memory. Is it like, okay, is it like when there's only like one core or something or no? No, it's, it's like, unrelated to that. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. Um, well, I, I, I said my guess, yeah, my guess was like that all, processes don't uh, share the same memory but yeah i guess that's it what's the edge case for that the edge I case wouldn't... is if they share the same code segment because it's read only oh okay i see so because there's no modifications it's 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 safe to share that same page okay i'll definitely read up on that yeah let me ask you in terms of um I want to stay on operating systems. Um, can you walk me through what happens after I make a system call? Yes, actually I can. So there's a thing called a trap interrupt happens. And so the trap interrupt um, gives, I actually learned about this like a month ago. Trap interrupt gives, um, like it gives kernel the control by like, uh, like from user, user space to kernel space, and it, I think it just moves the it switches the context, and then um, give me a sec to think about this. Yeah, sure, take your time. And after that, um, yeah. So I when the sys you asked about the syscall or would you ask? Sorry. So after a syscall is made, I call yeah. malloc. Malloc's a procedure the, call. It's part of the library, but it wraps yeah. a syscall. So what happens after I call malloc? Okay, so it goes into the kernel, and then like all the like the arguments of like that syscall are gonna be pushed onto the stack, um, and then there's like like all these like system calls have like numbers for them. Sure. And so then uh, it gets the number. So now it has all the arguments on the stack, and so. It gets all of those and then um, yeah, it executes and then it goes back to the, it shifts the context back to the user what, space. What, is it, what does it do with the number? Because you just, you, you're you right. Every syscall has yeah. a number associated with it. You mentioned something about trap and then you just abandoned it. Yeah. Well, I know just trap is like an interrupt that just like, I think like just disrupts the, like, the normal flow and just gives it to the kernel. Uh, so control. what's this thing about the trap? You mentioned something about it, but yeah. now you're just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly, I need to need to know more about that. But um, yeah, I just have like the association between trap and interrupts. Okay, so there's I something called about. the trap table. Yeah, and trap the trap table, table is indexed that. usually on the system call ID. Mm -hmm. And there's an associated trap handler. So the trap handler executes, and then there's a return from trap instruction that brings you back into user space. Okay, I see. Um, so definitely. that's the that's the direction I was looking for you to take the answer. Mm -hmm. I see. Usually in operating systems, this concept of like a dirty bit gets brought up often, um, and this is especially this is used especially when it comes to paging. So if I was mm. to tell you, if I was to ask you, like. What what is a what is a dirty bit or where is it used? What would you high level? What is it? A dirty bit. Um. I don't I don't exactly exactly know what a dirty bit is, but this is an operating system's kind of, three easy pieces. Yeah. Well, this doesn't have anything to do like with flushing or whatever, right? No. Am I right or no? Maybe in another context it does, but I, I'm specifically talking about paging. Yeah, I don't know the terminology of dirty bit. 
to be okay. honest. So there's like a page table entry. Do you remember that from Operating Systems 3Z pieces? Yeah, I, okay. So sorry, but like I kind of like read through the sections I found interesting and haven't finished everything. But That's yeah. fine. What I'm getting at is if a page table mm -hmm. has been written to, yeah. in the page table entry, it's marked as being dirty. Yeah. And oh, why okay, might you okay. think, now let me ask you, now that you know what that is, yeah. why might that be useful to know? Okay. So this is what I know about like that kind of dirty stuff. Or, so I, I guess there's a buffer cache and um, if this is related, you could tell me, but like I know there's like a buffer cache. And so it helps to like make it more speed, like make the thing faster. And so whenever like you write to, whenever like it, the buffer cache gets written, it's kind of dirty for a second before it gets actually written into like actual uh, memory for a little bit and you can use like um you can like change that up but like yeah it's dirty for a while that kind of like if it's in the buffer cache or whatever i don't really know yeah. what you mean by that like something's in the buffer cache is dirty and then it becomes clean after a while i don't understand oh. where you're going with this yeah that's that's my association with like dirty stuff like when t when you like like when you have a file system and I know we there's like a sort of thing where um, it's called like F sync, and um, it's about like kind I'm, of. I'm flushing. talking about pages though. I mentioned that like a couple like, of times, so I want you to talk about dirty bit in the context of paging. Yeah, I'm gonna say I don't know that much about that. That's fine. If you don't know, just say it. I don't. I just don't want to waste, you know, your uh, your energy, your mental energy. Yeah. Um, so uh, effectively, if like I mentioned, if it's marked as dirty, I asked. Um, the question was: Now that we know what a dirty bit is, what's its purpose? Um, mm -hmm. In pl in page replacement policies, uh, they will try to evict pages that aren't dirty first, because a dirty page requires you to write back that information to the hard disk, and that takes mm -hmm. time. So I would rather evict a page that I don't need to write back than evict a page that I do, because that takes up space time more energy etc so that that's okay. that's that's effectively what that is let me ask okay. you this uh we have a single core single thread system yeah with the single core single thread system yeah can the op can the operating system run at the same time as another program in other words if the operating system is running can any other program run at the same time um, my thought process behind this is I know threads on single core. Um, single thread, single core system, just to be clear. Yeah, yeah, I know on a, yeah, no, they cannot. I don't think usually there's not, you can't run programs like that um, in parallel. And why is that? Sorry, maybe let me rephrase that. Why okay. is it that when I the operating system is running, other... Mm -hmm software can't run uh, when the operating system is running then well because if the operating system was to like go to the program then i i guess like you would have to, you could you couldn't go back to the operating system you would kind of have to like turn it on and off or something um uh, yeah the, what I'm effectively looking for is I'm asking you like I'm not asking yeah. you about interrupts and stuff and how to get back how to how uh, like if there's a timer that interrupts the current program I'm not okay. asking you about like if the program's cooperative or not in relinquishing okay. its time I'm asking you like why can't the operating system run at the same time as another program the answer is because effectively because the thread. yeah the operating system is software just like the software you're running yeah. so it can't run when other software is running in a single-threaded context. Yeah. That was that, effectively what I was asking. Yeah, I, I, I understood the idea behind um, only, like there's only one thread. Let's behind, talk about like scheduling you because you just mentioned, we just talked about cooper cooperation. So the operating system relinquishes control to programs that it runs for a limited time. That's called yeah. limited direct execution. Yeah. If the operating system wants to regain control from that running program, think about the simplest case of a okay. single threaded single core system how does it do that um if you want to regain control yeah. i feel like i learned about this um in class 
Um, and I feel like if you'd say it, I would know it, but um, how would it regain control? Yeah, I, I don't know. I can't. I, yeah, I, I don't exactly know, but I feel like if you'd say it, I'd. I, It can either do so in a cooperative or uncooperative fashion. So the uncooperative is um, effectively a timer and an interrupt. Oh yeah. And the non-cooperative approach, and the cooperative approach is maybe I'll, maybe I'll ask you how does a program cooperatively relinquish control to the CPU? We talked about timers as being a non-cooperative approach. Okay. What's a cooperative approach? Um. Hey. Come on, man. I, I have faith. You read Operating Systems 3 Easy Pieces. The first chapter yeah, is unlimited I, I, direct I execution. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, I'll throw out a guess here. Um. Yeah, this is just a guess. I guess if, like, um,. Guys, the answer is not interrupt. I'm asking about a cooperative approach, not a uncooperative approach. Interrupts are uncooperative. Okay, so co cooperative. Like, if it's cooperative, I guess it would be syscalls. Okay, yeah, that is one. So like any networking call, anything that requires you to trap back into the OS, yeah. into kernel space, that's going to yeah. be cooperative. And um, you type on your keyboard, that's an interrupt. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 